Ains at Level 1. Chapter 15. Written by Dark Paladin 000. Marquis Alexander Haft. Child, not this thing again. Marquis Alexander was one of the three Marquises of the Draconic Kingdom. Marquis Porus had had his lands completely ravaged by the beastmen and had fled north with little but his clothes to his name, and Marquis Leonardo only held about one third of his original domain with the rest in beastmen hands. As such, Marquis Alexander, who controlled vast swathes of lands near the border of the Baharuth Empire was currently the most powerful of the three Marquis of the Draconic Kingdom. He was even able to muster approximately 45,000 men of his own if need be. This was not his only claim to power. Clarice, a magic caster of the fifth tier and a member of the Admantite team Crystal Tear was one of his children. It was this child of his who was trying to talk some sense into him. Marquis Alexander had found himself firmly planted as the archenemy to Suzuki Sotoru in the War Council discussions. Part of this was somewhat understandable Draudelin had done a mostly passable job of keeping the nobility weak and divided, but this effort had been undermined by Marquis Alexander's ability to hide most of his strength and stand aside, while the beastmen knocked over the power of the other nobles, thereby strengthening his own power by comparison. The fact that he had a voice in the country's only adamantite team during these tumultuous times only added to his influence. Most people in the world wanted to move up in society and for a Marquis there was only one more rank to reach for. As such, this man had his gaze fixed firmly on the throne. It was his plan to leverage his position to marry off his heir to the Queen when the time would come. This opportunity had been snatched from him by that adventurer. And now, Thanks to him, the nobility of the southern regions would slowly recover and his original opportunity had been snatched from him. However, this alone would not have been enough to turn the man against Suzuki. No, as a matter of fact, Marquis Alexander had been sly enough to attempt to gain that man's favour by suggesting they offer him a barony as a reward for his efforts. It was Suzuki's response which cemented Suzuki as his enemy the man had the gall to reject his offer. Not only that, but the man did it in an extremely offhand way, as if he thought nothing of the position. Marquis Alexander was one of those people who firmly believed that one's rank in society was everything in life as such, adventurers in general were the kinds of people whom he despised the most people who thought that pure strength was everything, and who were little better than barbarians in his opinion. Of course, he recognized their strength and necessity to the kingdom's survival, and as such played along with them but he firmly believed that even the lowest of nobles should be treated with more respect than any adventurer. Rank was rank, after all. Suzuki also refused to address the nobility with the respect that the Marquis felt they all deserved as such, he had few allies even amongst those whose lands were held to the south or who had fled from those sites. Such nobles would find it better to ally with the Marquis and by extension, Crystal Tear. Any noble who did support Suzuki despite these issues had probably no land to his name and as such no real power to get anything done. It was all made worse by the fact that Suzuki was clearly very wealthy and powerful, which stirred feelings of jealousy within the Marquis. Why should such a man have access to such magnificent clothes and adornments? A commoner should dress and act like a commoner, and a king should dress and act as a king. And why should he enjoy the company of a woman who was as beautiful as Albedo? who easily outclassed any of the many women he had bedded. One of such women had been Clarice's mother. Clarice was the second child of a concubine, and as such, would have probably been cast aside as a spare amongst spares were it not for her talent the same talent as that of Ninia of the Swords of Darkness. Unlike Ninia though, Clarice had been granted the best education and support money could buy from an early age. This was how she managed to reach the fifth tier at such a tender age. Of course. The reason that Marquis Alexander showered so much on her was because he saw it as an investment she would eventually lead to greater glory for him. As such, in his view, she should have been an obedient puppet. Therefore, her attempt to advise him was rather annoying. Father, surely it isn't a good idea to continue to antagonize that adventurer, Clarice said. Antagonize? It isn't me who threw the first stone, he replied flatly. He rejected the hand of friendship I extended to him, and now he will face the fist of an enemy. Father, that was because he truly had no interest in noble peerage, 
Clarice said. There were many adventurers like that and of course, these were the kind which her father despised the most. Not as a personal affront to you. It is not a wise decision to continue to antagonize him. Her father glared at her and Clarice, who had faced all manner of monsters without a hint of fear, wilted. There is no need to tell me of all people what is wise or not. Father, he is really strong. So? So are you and the rest of your team, the Marquis answered. And he most likely was only able to do so because of the assistance of that famed magic caster. Now, I have nothing more to say to you for now. Her father briskly walked towards the room where the next war council was being held, and Clarice, with a sigh, followed him. Clarice, despite her feelings, could not reprimand her father too much. Some adventurers didn't care about status but Clarice was not one of them. She couldn't gain the throne as she was a woman and could not be married off to the queen, but her father had promised to give her the rank of an earl so long as she went along with his plans. Her father had seven other children in line before Clarice would even have a shot at being his heir, as such, her only shot of becoming a noble of high status was to play along with him. In the war council room, Clarice walked over to the rest of her team. There was Cecilia, a woman with long silvery hair whose skills with the bow were said to rival those of the father of a soon-to-be pope in the Holy Robel Kingdom. Then there was Candice, a woman who was a powerful illusionist and wore a dark green cloak. Of course, there was also their leader Cerebrate, who, if you were to rank the people in the room by how much they hated Suzuki, would rank as number two easily. No matter how much Clarice tried to talk him out of his position, he just wouldn't budge. The reason was simple he was smitten with the queen and had gotten it into his head that he might one day be able to marry her, if only he saved the country from the invading beast men. Thing was, Clarice thought that this might indeed be possible. Draudelin did have to rely on his team a lot, and if he won a great victory, he might have even been able to ask for the queen's hand in marriage. It was a bit far-fetched, but depending on how the situation unfolded, not completely out of the realm of possibility depending on how he played his cards. This all was, of course, dashed to pieces as Suzuki almost eliminated the need for him entirely. Cerebrate had made up countless reasons to justify hating Suzuki for example, the latest was the fact that Suzuki was breaking the rules by using Fludur, who was not technically an adventurer, on his team. All of his objections eventually turned a good portion of the guild against Suzuki. Clarice wanted to beat some sense into him, but much as with the situation with her father, her hands were tied. Cerebrate was a swordsman who rivaled the famed Gazef Stranoff himself, and no one else on his team was quite as strong as he was. Clarice herself only knew one fifth tier spell which was an elemental ice spell, and while theoretically she could leave Crystal Tear and look for opportunities elsewhere, it was unlikely that she would be able to form another Admontite team resulting in the fact that she felt like she had to go along with him and his plans. That said, 99 times out of a hundred Clarice found it easy to get along with her teammates, this was just that hundredth time where they had a disagreement. Candice and Cecilia had no strong reasons to hate Suzuki, but both felt that they should not support an outsider like Suzuki over their own teammate, as such, Clarice was all alone in this regard. Clarice knew there were several adventurer teams who were interested in working with Suzuki and his team, but they shied away from making advances because of Cerebrate's hatred. This meant that both Cerebrate and Marquis Alexander were on the same side though ironically, of course, their goals clashed with each other. If the Marquis won, Cerebrate would be unable to marry Draudelin, but for now, it seemed they had found a common enemy. Crystal Tear was the only adventurer team allowed in the war councils. Alongside them were a large number of nobles, arranged as they were in three factions. To one side sat Alphonse, the commander of the Eighth Imperial Legion. Towards the center sat the Prime Minister, the Queen's spokesperson. That is to say, he would normally be there. Today was an important day as the Queen had moved from the capital here to speak at the War Council personally, and he was standing towards the side. As the queen walked in, Clarice could hear Cerebrate gasp as he looked at her. She really wished he wouldn't be so open in his obsession over her. Everyone stood up as she walked in, and she motioned for them to sit down. So cute. Cerebrate nearly moaned. 
Draudelin looked around, and then said, Sorry but where is Suzuki Dono? Sarah Brait's face soured, and the Prime Minister glanced around. Ah, Your Highness, Suzuki Dono has been absent for yesterday's meeting as well. He has gone to take care of some personal business. The first one to respond was Marquis Alexander. This is unacceptable, Your Majesty. What could possibly be more important than this war council? Not to mention he has chosen to leave after he had been promised the treasures of this kingdom. We should declare our alliance with him null and void. The Prime Minister frowned. Peace, Marquis Alexander. He has not abandoned us rather he has left an elder lick in his room who can call him at any time we need him. He can teleport back here at any time after all. This is an even bigger slight against us, Marquis Alexander said. To station one of the undead in a refined establishment what if the temples caught wind of his actions? And does he think that we are his servants that we should go around prostrating ourselves before him and begging for his help? He then looked around him. I, for one, believe that we should stop feeding into this foreigner's ego. If he believes he is too important to stand before us, and especially on this day, when the queen herself has visited us, then let us ask ourselves, have we no pride of our own? We have our own armies, and we can surely deal with the invading beast men ourselves. Draudelin, in response, simply tilted her head and said, I don't think it's such a big deal. Plus, Suzuki Dono's really strong. I bet he'll come to work with us if we ask. Everything about the motion of her head to the enunciation of her words were played perfectly, and would have melted the hearts of most present save for those such as Marquis Alexander who were old enough to know this was all an act. Your Majesty! Sarah Brait suddenly exclaimed. I assure you that I am more than enough to deal with the remaining beast men. Only for the briefest of instants, disgust flashed on Draudelian's face before she smiled and said, Ah, yes, thank you, Sarah Brait Dono. As this was going on, the wheels in Marquis Alexander's head began turning as he thought of a plan. Your Highness, I would like to submit a proposal. If we agree to exclude this adventurer from the upcoming battles, I would gladly commit my own troops to the cause to free the remaining cities. There was chatter throughout the room, mainly because Alexander had just done a complete 180 from his original position, which was to deny those cities any aid whatsoever. His plan was simple, he knew that he couldn't stall out the war for much longer, and he felt that this way he could easily gain credit as the one who had saved the country and the southern cities. He could then leverage the glory he would get for more power, which is what he was after. The other two factions gave voices of agreement, the reason being that they were eager for any action to take place to retake their homes after so many weeks of pointless debating. Even the Prime Minister had to admit that it was a tantalizing proposal, they could all end the political stalemate that had existed for several weeks. Also, given the beastmen's thinned ranks they could probably easily obtain victory with their current forces. What does Crystal Tear have to say regarding this matter? The beast men probably still had a few exceptional individuals among them for which they would need an adamantite team. We heartily agree with Marquis Alexander's proposal. Cerebrate said immediately. The Prime Minister and Draudelin exchanged a silent glance essentially they both agreed that this compromise was better than nothing. All the while, Alphonse of the Eighth Legion couldn't help but think. This is the largest collection of fools which I have ever laid my eyes upon. This man had seen the might of Suzuki Sotoru firsthand, and knew now that the rumours regarding him were true. Fluda Paradigm was one of Alphonse's personal heroes growing up, and when he had heard there was a magic caster greater than Fluda, he had initially scoffed at the very notion. But if upon seeing the man's performance, he now realised that he had been greatly mistaken. Suzuki was a person who far outclassed Fluda Paradine. As such, given these people had already promised him payment, the decision to not to use him was baffling. It was like going to a five-star restaurant, paying for your whole meal, but still demanding to buy all the ingredients, make the food, and wash the dishes yourself. Then again, if that were all, Alphonse would just think that they were fools, but no more foolish than perhaps your average fool. The Draconic Kingdom could of course win against the remaining beastmen though they would end up taking needless casualties on their own end. As it was, 
he was not in a position to say anything to these people as it would reflect badly on the empire, and he was not much more than an honorary guest in this meeting. The reason he felt like they had collectively broken all records for idiocy was because he knew that Marquis Alexander would not stop, at this. After winning, he would definitely push for Suzuki to be denied his payment. The Prime Minister and Draudelin had probably not realized it yet, but Alphonse was sure that that was what this was all leading up to. And he would gladly have Crystal Tears backing and by extension, that of the Adventurers Guild. And once that happened, well, Alphonse was happy that the Blood Emperor was withdrawing this legion back to his homeland very soon. Alphonse knew those orders would be coming any day now, and Alphonse wanted to be as far away from this country as possible when the incident would happen. He was also quite happy that the ruler of his own country had purged the nobility very successfully so situations like this would not arise in his own country. Most of the Beastmen army had been wiped out and the last remaining large force was cowering in the city of Arya like a bunch of trapped rats. The hunters had become the hunted. There were only three among them of great renown, one was a rabbit man by the name of Emilia, who had striking blue eyes and a frame that would easily enchant any man. She was renowned as a powerful monk. Then there was Vicus, a leopard man who was famous for using spiritual magic of the fourth tier. Lastly, there was Theseus, a minotaur. Technically, his name was Theseus Nine, being the ninth of his name. If rumors were to be believed, he was descended from the minotaur sage, who had also been named Theseus. He had not awakened the fabled powers which some of the descendants of the minotaur sage were said to possess but he was easily as strong as the martial lord when it came to pure strength. He had also been trained in a form of swordsmanship by a teacher in the city-state alliance, and with his skill he had managed to easily climb the ranks amongst the beastmen and gained control over a large tribe. They had all managed to run roughshod over this country and its forces, but it all changed when they had seen those legendary undead steeds riding towards them. Their resolve broke, and most of the army fled, with Theseus and the rest having little choice but to follow them. The three of them were discussing their next move. A messenger walked in, a rabbit man. Lady Amelia, the rumors are true. The other two wings of our army were wiped out completely. Amelia sighed, and with a swift motion crushed the messenger's skull. Executing a messenger who carried a message of defeat or other bad news was not unheard of but usually avoided in human circles. Amongst the demi-humans where might was everything, no one faulted Amelia, though Theseus was annoyed that she had just killed off a potential soldier when their ranks were already so thin. She sighed again. It seems as if it's just us left then. All the other remarkable beastmen, such as Garuda a birdman with powerful bard skills, the master assassin Varni, the axe-wielding Bertha, the divine magic caster Nero, and the famed tactician Erika were all dead. If we gather the remainder of our forces scattered about the rest of the cities, we might be able to piece together a force of 25,000, Theseus said. And what use will that be? Vicus asked. We will be slaughtered if the humans can summon more soul eaters. Theseus honestly wanted to test out his skills against one of those undead, but while his tribe fled and he gazed upon those monsters, his instincts had told him that he couldn't fight three of them together, and he joined them in their retreat. What if that was a single-use dark magic ritual, difficult to replicate? Theseus asked. It would make sense as to why we haven't seen it being used earlier. Regardless, in the end there are two choices, fight or flee? Emilia said. Their choice was quickly made for them. As a messenger arrived telling them that a force of around 50,000 humans was rapidly approaching the city gates. Amelia nearly killed this messenger too, but Theseus asked him if soul eaters were among the enemy forces. Thankfully, they were not, and the messenger got to keep his head. Theseus drew his sword. If they tried to run, most of them would be killed. If these were all normal humans, they might be able to fend them off or at least hold them off for some of the others to escape. As the leader of his tribe, Theseus felt that he had the responsibility to defend them. Call for reinforcements to come as quick as they can, Theseus said. Let's hope they manage to get here in time. For several days, Suzuki, Albedo, 
and Fluder had wandered around the area between the three nearby Beastmen nations where the tomb they were looking for was supposed to be located. At night, they would teleport back to the city of Erantel, Suzuki didn't want to rest in the Draconic Kingdom or the Empire, and he didn't want to show Fluder his hideout yet, keeping up the appearance that Suzuki was still in the city. By day, they would scout the area. They had only rumors to go on, and as such, they ran into dead ends and old ruins all of which were not the place they were looking for. If they ever ran into beast men, their policy was to run away via teleportation. It had been a few days, which kind of made Suzuki a little antsy. He did wonder occasionally why it was that the people of the Draconic Kingdom were taking so long to reach a decision. He had expected his elder Lick to contact him and give him an update by now, but he had heard nothing from that end. He could still feel a connection to that elder Lick, so he knew that it had not been destroyed, so perhaps he would check up on it when they were done with their exploration. All right then, this does look like the place, Suzuki said. Of course, while there might be powerful treasures inside, there are also probably traps and powerful enemies. Fluder, make sure to use undeath form in case we face poison or the such. Suzuki used his amulet of the skeleton mage, and Fluder knew how to use the spell himself. Understood, teacher, Fluder said. His eyes had a new gleam to them if there were treasures comparable to those which could be found in the capital of the Eight Kings, then there would no doubt be powerful guards in place. Guards whom Fluder could not defeat, but he had no doubt that his teacher could handle them. They encountered surprisingly little resistance inside, which made Suzuki wonder if, for a minute, they were in some other place. However, out of a hallway the tapping of staffs on the ground could be heard. From a corridor emerged six elder leiches, a group powerful enough to take out a small city. Widen maximize magic, grand fireball. Suzuki said, and the fourth tier spell, which was an upgraded version of the third tier fireball spell, enveloped the enemy group, burning them to cinders instantly. Looks like we're on the right track then. But if we saw six elder leiches here, there might be more powerful undead than them further in. Fluder had difficulty believing undead more powerful than an elder lick existed, but he heeded those words nonetheless. Further within the tomb, the night lick by the name of Kapul stiffened. For over a hundred years, he had lived in this place. He had first heard tales of it from another member of Corpus of the Abyss, whereupon he set out to inspect it himself. There were rumored to be great treasures inside. Unfortunately, the treasures were guarded by golems which even he, an eighth-tier magic caster, could not defeat. As a matter of fact, he had been lucky to escape with his life, which was only because he could use the spell Greater Teleportation and because the guardians would not follow him. Unfortunately, it appeared that the innermost chamber had an item that blocked teleportation into it. For the past hundred years, Kapul had spent time trying to build his power and better understand this place he hoped to one day be able to defeat or control the golems guarding the treasury. Of course, Kapul had no idea if anything valuable was really in there, but he assumed that if it was so well guarded the possibility was very high. The owner had likely set up the golems with a command to guard the treasury, and had not lived to return to rescind that command, and the golems carried out their last orders until the very end of time. He had dealt with invaders on occasion, and transformed their corpses into undead he had never failed to repel any intruders. Until this day. His undead detection ability had suddenly flared up telling him two undead had entered his home. One of them was stronger than an elder lick but weaker than him, but one of them was even stronger than he was. Even amongst the strongest members of Corpus of the Abyss, an international organization of undead magic casters, there were no undead who were that strong. He immediately sent six of his elder leiches to investigate, hoping to use undead slave sight to get a glimpse of the intruder, but all of them had been slain before he could even cast the spell. Now, for the first time since he had last faced those golems, he felt fear. What was he to do now? He did not think he could win against this foe, but at the same time, he was sure that it wouldn't be able to beat the guardians deeper inside. In such a case, it was best for him to teleport away, and come back later once they had been killed. He grabbed his most valuable scrolls and treasure and teleported away. As for his summons, he told them to hide themselves. 
he would feel nothing if they were all destroyed. Suzuki and his team had wandered into various rooms with somewhat interesting artifact scrolls in a language Suzuki couldn't understand, but which seemed important, furniture, and some magical items. But they all seemed to have been collected by the Elder Leiches and not by the original person who had owned this place. Suzuki had not run into any other monsters while wandering the halls. It is possible that the Elder Leiches were the rulers of this tomb, and decided to come together to defeat us as they sensed how powerful we were, Fluder said. It is possible for some undead to sense other undead, and we are using spells that grant us the ability of undead, after all. Suzuki had to note that was a possibility, but he thought that it was more likely they were wandering right into a trap. The lack of any attacks made him extremely wary. Finally, they came upon a large room filled to the brim with scrolls and which looked like it had only recently been vacated. Suzuki would come back for the scrolls later, he wanted to first see if there really was a great treasure hidden deep inside. But it did make him wonder what exactly had happened to the person who lived in this room had that person been one of the elder leiches. As it was, they had not seen anything resembling a dining hall or sleeping quarters, so the occupants of this place were likely all undead. As it was, Suzuki felt it was odd to call this place a tomb given there didn't seem to be anyone buried inside. It seemed more like an administrative headquarters which had been abandoned over time, and was likely dubbed a tomb because of the elder leiches who lived in there. They then went even deeper, finally stopping before a pair of extremely ornate doors. Suzuki-sama, there is something strong behind those doors, Albedo said, withdrawing her weapon. Let me go first. All right, Suzuki said, and he opened the doors. This action immediately triggered the three golems behind the door to identify the three of them as enemies. They were made of Stygian iron, a metal of higher quality than even adamantite. They were approximately level 70 golems who, despite being relatively low-leveled, could stall even high-level players for some time. Their counterpoint was that they could not use magic, but they were extremely tanky. Suzuki grabbed Fluder and teleported the two of them 50 feet back, so that Albedo had enough room to engage these golems. She had a good level advantage, but she was outnumbered, something Suzuki planned to change. Summon Undead Ninth A zombie shield maiden appeared, and began engaging one of the golems. The sound of her world item clashing against the golem swords rang throughout the hall. The zombie shield maiden, a warrior in a black viking outfit who carried two shields, could not have possibly held her own against these golems, but that was not why Suzuki had summoned her. He had summoned her because if she took a few hits, it would be easier for Albedo to find an opening since she wouldn't have to defend herself from so many attacks. The fight was going well until Fluder exclaimed, Teacher! Suzuki whirled around to see an undead he had not encountered in this world before a night lick. It had probably teleported behind them so this was a pincer attack. Dark Barrier. Fluder cast, reacting before Suzuki could. Teacher this one can use 8th tier magic. Suzuki was now on guard, especially as he had sent his summon to help Albedo. However, the Night Lick did not attack them, and instead took a few paces back before casting greater teleportation to flee. Forgive me, Suzuki-sama, Albedo said as she used her ability Dimension Lock which would block teleportation towards their area. She hadn't used it before because Suzuki had not encountered an enemy who could teleport, and that skill had a limited number of uses. Nothing else interrupted the fight any further, and as the golems grew weak, Suzuki took to bombarding them with spells. Unfortunately, he ran out of mana so he could only finish off two of them, and Albedo finished off the third herself. What was that? Suzuki asked as there was quiet in the area now. The Night Lick had not attempted to return why hadn't it attacked them? The eight levels he had gained were immediately assigned in case there was a stronger foe deeper inside. Mage 15 LV Battle Mage 10 LV Sorcerer 10 LV Necromancer 10 LV Umbromancer 8 LV True Necromancer 8 LV Master of the Dark Arts 5 LV Immortal 1 LV Total, 0 racial plus 67 job equals 67 levels. 
As was usual, he kept one level in reserve. As he leveled up though, he was able to gain the skill Create Middle Tier Undead twice per day, and his uses of Create Low Tier Undead had been increased to 12 per day. Normally, if he had still been leveling up as an undead, he would have also gotten High Tier Physical Nullification I which would nullify any physical attacks, which were made by enemies level 20 and lower. However, he had chosen to go down a slightly different path during this playthrough so to speak, instead wanting to go for one of the skills which reduced all damage by a set amount which was far more useful in PvP. Though he didn't know it right now, this decision was going to lead to a massive tragedy in the future. He gained the spell's gate, summon undead tenth, explosion, true dark, void heart, his favorite grasp heart, and energy drain. He also gained a resistance to certain magical spells, but it worked more like Shulter's immunity rather than his immunity as Mamunga, being based on power rather than simply on the tier level of the magic being cast. He also gained the skills Dispair Aura, I and Dispair Aura too, as well as Necromancer's Glory IA skill which gave slight buffs to undead under his command. Fluda noticed the sudden surge in Suzuki's magical aura, and he couldn't believe that his lifelong wish had finally come true. It was there the myth that he had sought his whole life. The tenth tier of magic. It was now that he understood his teacher got stronger after killing enemies. It was the only thing that made sense of his sudden rises in power, and he considered himself a fool for not noticing it earlier. Had he not been used to Suzuki's aura as a ninth tier caster, he might have started weeping on the spot. Someday, he needed to make that power his own, but for now, he was happy to just have witnessed it with his own eyes. Satisfied for now, Suzuki decided they should move forward. They came upon a room filled with gold coins arranged in piles taller than Suzuki himself. He examined one of them it was a coin from Yggdrasil. The room was filled with other treasures. One thing that really piqued Suzuki's interest was an axe which on appraisal was a custom weapon clearly made by someone from Yggdrasil confirming the fact that players existed somewhere in this world. The axe in question was powerful but ultimately useless to both Suzuki and Albedo, who had stronger melee weapons than it. There were several things which were better than anything he had ever seen in this world. There were several wands of resurrection, a ring of sustenance, several magical scrolls and Yggdrasil crystals containing spells up to the tenth tier, and several items capable of casting various spells. There was an item that would block teleportation within a limited area, which was definitely going to New Nazarick. There were also several prismatic ores of a quality one could not find elsewhere. Of note was the Ring of the Unicorn Prince, which was an upgraded version of the Ring of the Unicorn Lord, which itself was a more powerful version of the Ring of Unicorn. Suzuki put it on after removing his Ring of Unicorn, quite satisfied at the absolute poison and disease resistance the new item granted him along with the ability to use a sixth-tier healing spell once a day. There were also several piles of items that Suzuki and probably any other player would consider to be junk, but would have accumulated a lot of if they played Yggdrasil seriously, like some race-changing items, a pile of Horn of the Goblin General, and other such items. Clearly the treasure trove belonged to a warrior given the assortment of items, which could cast spells for the user an assumption strengthened by the presence of there being far more weapons and armor, compared to equipment that would be useful to a magic caster like Suzuki. There was one issue though while Albedo and Suzuki were one team, Fluda was a newcomer and Suzuki wasn't sure on how to split part of the treasure with him. True, the two of them had done almost all of the work, but Fluda had helped them all come this far, and it wouldn't sit right with Suzuki to give him nothing. Ah, Fluda good work on that dark barrier spell, Suzuki said. It had been the first time that Fluda had been able to cast it after several weeks of trying, perhaps spurred on by the perceived danger of that situation they had been in. It is absolutely nothing before the power that you hold, Fluda said. And it was only through your guidance that I was able to learn how to cast that spell. Suzuki rubbed his neck as far as he knew he had done absolutely nothing to help Fluda to learn that new spell. It was partly out of this guilt that he felt that he needed to compensate Fluda in some way. Here is a thank you, I'd like you to keep this wand. Teacher, I require none of the items here. I only wish to learn magic from you, and your teachings are far more than payment enough, Fluda said. 
While deep down, he would have liked to take some of the items, being Suzuki's student and possibly unlocking the powers of the tenth tier for himself was far more important to him. Suzuki squirmed. Yes, but I believe hard work should be rewarded appropriately. In that case, I will take what you give me with gratitude, Fluder said. Suzuki equipped some of the items, and then split the rest between his own inventory and Albedo so that they both had access to some of the more important consumables. Suzuki had been a little disappointed that there were no Divine Class items, or powerful cash shop items, but he figured that most players wouldn't have even had them in the first place and it was too much to expect that he would have found some here. Still, he doubted that he could ever find a similar treasure trove anywhere in this world. The gold alone totaled 60 million gold pieces, after all. 